Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's pray and then we'll get started this evening. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to share from your word. Father, we believe, as the song we were just singing says, we just believe, Father, that you will come, your Holy Spirit will just take charge of this service. Father, we just believe that you are free to move, free to operate here at Faith and Victory Church. We just thank you for that. And we, we have an expectation to receive from your word tonight, to receive from your spirit, who is the teacher of the church. And we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to be talking about the battleground of the mind. Hallelujah. And, and though that may sound like a Star Trek title <laughs> for an episode, it's not, praise the Lord. I thought about it. I was driving down the road thinking the battlefield of the mind. I thought, boy, that sounds like a, an episode. <laughs> but it's not, praise the Lord. That's actually, actually what we're going to be talking about. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. This is a very familiar portion of Scripture. And uh, it's talking about fighting the good fight of faith. Now, you may remember the last time I taught, we were talking about how do you fight the good fight of faith. And I want to just remind us of a few things about that teaching. Uh, fighting the good fight of faith, first of all, we know it's not against flesh and blood, obviously. And uh, we're going to see here in just a couple of verses that that's exactly correct. It's not against flesh and blood. It is a spiritual battle. However, uh, there's not a lot said about how exactly we fight the good fight of faith. And we talked a bit about last time that I taught about uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and how we use words to fight a spiritual battle. We don't have a physical sword, we have a sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so when we speak the Word, that's how we fight. We don't use our fists because Satan is uh, a spirit, he is not physical. If he was physical, okay, maybe we could do a little fist to cuss, but that's not, that's not, it doesn't work with him. He's not a physical being. So what we have to do is concentrate on what exactly we need to do to fight that good fight of faith. And the battlefield of this fight is in the mind. And that's what I want us to see here this evening. So let's look at 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Well, of course, as we always point out, it is a good fight. It's good because we win it. We know going in that we win this fight as long as we fight it the way we're supposed to. The good fight of faith has to stay in the realm of faith. It has to stay in the realm of the Spirit. Again, if we try to do it naturally, we're outside of the realm that God wants us to operate in. If we try to fight against people, then we're outside of the Spirit that God wants us to operate in when it comes to fighting the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou also have been called, and hath professed, or confessed, the word professed, confessed, both of the same Greek word here, professed a good profession or confessed a good confession, you could also read it that way, before many witnesses. So right off the bat, we find out that finding the good fight of faith has to do with confession. But let's keep reading here. For, uh, actually, hold on, second, uh, 1 Timothy 6.12, also go to uh, 2 Corinthians 10.3 while we're... Uh, we're doing that, and I will pull up something here that I did need, after all. thought that I didn't, but I do. And that is uh, eSword. And by the way, I I'm usually mention this at some point, but eSword is just an excellent tool. It really, really is. And it's free. And eSword, uh, in the past, has been only uh, for uh, Windows computers, it is now available for uh, Mac computers as well. So that is excellent. And uh, 1 Timothy 6.12 is where I want to, to go for what I was looking for here. And uh, the one thing about it is that it is a little different from what I'm used to on Windows. Uh, 
Hallelujah. First Timothy six. Wow. Now, just in case you're wondering, I did install uh, this just recently. <laughs> so that's why I'm having such a hard time getting it to work for me. All right, First Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou hast uh, also been called and hath professed a good profession. Homologio is the Greek word here. That's uh, what I wanted to look up. I wanted to be sure that was correct. Professed a good profession before many witnesses. Now the thing about homologio, if you break that down, homologio, homo means the same, logio is words, so the same words. So we're speaking the same words as God. That's the whole point of what we're talking about here. And so when it says, fight the good fight of faith, uh, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou also are called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep hit this commandment without spot, unbreakable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to fight this good fight of faith with our profession, with words. Now if we go to um, Corinthians, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, chapter 10, uh, and let's, let's see, let's begin in verse, um, verse 2. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, whereunto I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, now obviously we walk in the flesh. We are physically here in this natural body. But keep in mind, you are a spirit. You have a soul, which is by will and emotions. You live in a physical body. So we have flesh, but we, the real us, is a spirit man. So it goes on to say here, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And I said last time when we were talking about fighting the good fight of faith, the problem is a lot of Christians want to war against flesh. They want to fuss on Facebook. They want to, you know, they want to fuss with one another. They want to get into an argument of words. And I'll tell you this, and, and pastors pointed this out before, if you try to fight Satan rationally with arguments, he's had thousands of years to develop his arguments. Uh, there's no reason to reason with him. The Bible does not say, come, let us reason together, saith the devil. Okay? That's not what we're supposed to do. We don't have to argue with him. We don't have to reason with him. We're to exercise authority over the devil in the name of Jesus, because Jesus has defeated him. Now, yes, I will say this, the devil is an opponent that has the ability to deceive. As I said, he has arguments that he's refined over the years. If you try to get into the arena of argument with him, outside the Word of God, just try to, you know, just fuss. On that level, you're, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Because he fights in that mental realm. And he'll get in there and he'll just wheedle his way in there and he'll start deceiving you. And I mean, think about what happened with Eve. She was deceived. And it says Adam was there with her and she, he wasn't deceived. He saw, he had his eyes wide open. But she literally was deceived. And he just, he's got that silver tongue, you know. He just wrapped her around his little finger, verbally speaking. But we don't have to do that. We do not war after the flesh, it says, for the weapons of our warfare, the kind of warfare we're talking about here, are not carnal. Now this word carnal uh, is the Greek word sarkikos. It means pertaining to the flesh, that is by extension bodily, temporal, that is subject to time, or by implication animal or unregenerate, carnal or fleshly. Okay, so it is talking about the fleshly realm. Our weapons are not fleshly. They're not physical. They're not subject to temporal, you know, the temporal world, the natural world. 
but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, if you, are, if you have a Bible, you can underline in, and I hope you do, because if you don't, go get you one, you can. <laughs> underline the word strongholds there. We're going to come back to that. Uh, pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, underline imaginations, and every high thing, underline that, high thing, that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, underline that word thought, to the obedience of Christ. So these are the areas that we're to fight a war in. These are the weapons that he's going to bring against you in the spiritual realm, or really in the mental realm, because as I say, that's the battleground, that's the realm he tries to fight in, because that's the realm he's good at fighting in. You know, he's not really good at fighting spiritually because you're a born-again believer. The Holy Spirit is inside you. I mean, he is vastly outnumbered and overpowered if it comes to the spiritual realm. You see what I'm saying? Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have spiritual forces of various kinds, powers, principalities, rulers of darkness of this world. There are demon spirits and so forth. But you know, for the most part, that's not where you're fighting, really. Now, there's nothing wrong with interceding. There's nothing wrong with praying. There's nothing against, wrong with standing up against you know, spiritual forces and all that. But really, for the most part, the war that we're to war, he delineates here what that war is. Notice he doesn't say to dress in fatigues and go up on the building and, and pray and you know, have big you know, intercession thing, you know, with combat boots. You know, pastors talked about that before. Get, you know, somewhere in the, the middle of town in the highest tower and get up there and spiritual warfare. Well, let me ask you this. Are those fatigues natural or spiritual? They're natural. The, the combat boots, are they natural or spiritual? They're natural. You're not called on to do natural warfare. Yeah, but I'm getting up there and I'm, I'm battling the devil in the spiritual realm. Well, now, praise the Lord, that's great, I guess. I mean, your heart probably is in the right place, but your head isn't. Because he says here, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare. Well, if the weapons of our warfare is what he's about to talk about here, then this must be the area where the warfare takes place. So he says the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of these areas of fight. Strongholds, imaginations, uh, high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, and faults. Those areas. So the battle must be in those areas. Right? If we're to battle, these are the ways he's going to come against us. I was listening to Keith Moore recently. He was talking about fighting the good fight of faith, and he made this statement. He said, spiritual warfare takes place in this realm of imaginations, strongholds, faults, that realm. He said, very rarely is there a situation where you are fighting with demon spirits. I mean, really. That, that's a rare thing. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I've had situations where it has happened. And uh, I'll tell you this. God usually, at least in my case, now maybe, maybe he goes easy on me. <laughs> you know, bless his heart. You know, we're going, we're going to help this boy. And I'm glad. Praise the Lord. I'm glad he did. But I was minding my own business one day, and I got a call from a pastor. Now, this was many, many, many years ago. This is back when I was on radio in 1980. Oh, wow, 1980, 1981, somewhere in that time frame. And this pastor friend of mine called. Brother Bill, can you come up here and help me in Lexington? I said, sure, yeah, brother, I'll be glad to come on up there. He said, yeah, I need you to cast the devil out of somebody. Well, I went, uh, okay. Now, you know, I was young, <laughs> and I was inexperienced. I'll say that, you know, 1980, I was a fairly young guy. And so, uh, but this pastor has asked me to come cast the devil out of a guy, so I thought, well, praise the Lord. So I just strike off for Lexington. I'm driving up the road. And as I'm driving up the, the road, the Lord spoke to me. Now, I hadn't fasted. I hadn't prayed. I hadn't sought the Lord. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just going to go exercise my authority. That's, that's all I had in mind. So I'm driving down the road, and the Lord said to me, Who are you? Well, I, you know, I kind of thought he knew who I was. Knew my name, you know. So I said, uh, Lord, what, what do you mean by that? Who are you? So I thought a minute, and I thought, well, what's he looking for? He, he knows who I am, so, oh, 
Lord, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He said, that's right. Remember that. I said, well, okay. Well, that's all he said to me. You know, I mean, great, great preparation, but it, that's all I needed, so that's all he said to me. So I go up there, and we go to this guy's house. And as I walk in, the, the, the man's wife is there, and she's just wringing her hands. Oh, Pastor, I'm so glad you came. Oh, Pastor, I, I need help. And so this pastor says, well, uh, sister, what's the problem? Well, he came in, he was drunk, and he was violent, and he went into the bedroom, and, and now he's closed the door, and he won't come out. So, and the pastor turns to me and says, yeah, he's demon-possessed. You need to cast the devil out of him. I said, all right. <laughs> so we come, we knock on the door, didn't get any response. So finally open the door and go in, and he's laying there on the bed. Looked like he was passed out drunk. So, oh, well, this is, going, this is not going to be a big deal because he's passed out. Well, as soon as I walked in, this guy raised up out of bed. Now, I'm, I'm not kidding you. It looked like something out of an exorcist movie because he just come rise it up and point his finger in one motion. Points his finger at me and says, Who do you think you are? I said, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I knew the right answer. <laughs> God had already shared it with me. <laughs> so he just kind of looked at me, you know, like, uh, like he didn't know what to do with that. I said, Come out of him in the name of Jesus. And bam! I mean, he just collapsed like he was like all the, the stuff in it had fallen out of him. You know, he just flopped on the bed. So I just turned to his wife. I said, now, uh, when, when he comes to himself, get him something to eat and he'll be fine. Have him come to church and, and get in the church. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We, we left and the pastor said, uh, well, Brother Bill, I'm so sure glad you came cast the devil out of him. I said, well, no problem. <laughs> Got in the car and drove off. As far as I knew, that was it, all right? Sometime later, Come to find out, the guy was delivered. He went back to his job, which, by the way, was being a DJ at a local Christian station. Hallelujah. And went back to church, and as far as I know to this day, is a strong believer. Had no problem with that. Well, praise the Lord. You know, I'm not saying that won't happen. It can happen that you get into a spiritual warfare of that nature. But notice what the Lord told me. He knew what he was going to do. And so he knew to remind me of who I was in Christ Jesus. I didn't have to stammer around. I didn't have to, oh, what, is he, what am I supposed to say? You know, Anything like that, I knew exactly how to reply, and I used the word on him. But I used the word on him. Really, that's where the battle took place, was in the word. It didn't have anything to do with me being a spiritual hotshot. Matter of fact, I was not a spiritual hotshot, and I have yet to become a spiritual hotshot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I know who I am in Christ Jesus. And I know the authority that we have over the devil in the name of Jesus. So praise the Lord. So I'm not saying that that's not going to happen. However, for the, the vast majority of the time, when we fight this fight, we're fighting with weapons that are not carnal but are strong to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, uh, things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I'll say this. One time when I was teaching on these scriptures, I was in Winston-Salem. This was back again in the early 80s. And I was in Winston-Salem and I was teaching along these lines. And the Lord said, read it backwards. I love how he does things like this to me. Usually it's when I'm teaching. He'll say something like this to me and I'll say, he'll say, read it backwards. And I'm like, What? And I, I, I didn't understand. I kind of stopped. You know, I said, uh, okay, read it backwards. And so I went here and I started going backwards. Every thought to the obedience of Christ, uh, things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, casting down imaginations and pulling down the strongholds. And then as soon as I did that, he said, that's the order he comes in. And I went, Really? <laughs> You know, I mean, this is not something I had studied out in great detail. But this is what he said. That's the order it comes in. So let's look at it that way. Thoughts. First, he comes with a thought. He doesn't come first with a stronghold. He comes with a thought. Now make note of this, because this will help you. The first area Satan tries to attack in is just simply a thought. He'll drop one in there and see what happens. What are you going to do with that thought? 
Now the thought may be as simple as, well, I know you're believing for your healing, but it's not going to manifest this time. That's a thought. Now it's a thought that is incorrect, contrary to Scripture, and if you could take the Scripture and just blow that completely away. Because we know that healing is the will of God. We know that Jesus bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. That by His stripes we were healed. If we were healed, then we are the healed. So I am the healed. So me not getting manifestation of, of healing is just not scriptural. But He'll drop that thought in there. What is He going to do with it? Well, I need to do what I just did. Take the scripture and say, I'm the healed of the Lord. Find the scripture that says, Jesus bore my sicknesses, carried my diseases, by his stripes we were healed. Take the word of God and do what to this thought? We are to bring the thought to the obedience of Christ. We're to make that thought obedient to the word of God and to Christ. Christ, of course, being the anointed one in his anointing. So is the idea, the thought, that I might not get healed... Is that contrary to the anointed one and his anointing? Absolutely. So I need to take that thought and do something with it. I need to cast that thought down. I need to get that thought and completely get it out of my mind. Now, here's something that Keith Moore said as he was teaching that I really liked. He said, don't sit around and think on the thoughts of the devil. In other words, when Satan drops a thought in there, you're not going to get healed this time. Don't sit around and go, why am I not going to get healed this time? Oh my, I'm not going to get healed this time. See, you're meditating on the word of the devil. And that will bring, what happens if you meditate on the word of the devil, that will bring fear, because fear is the reciprocal of faith. How do we operate in faith? We meditate on the word of God, and that builds faith into our heart. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Well, fear cometh by hearing the word of the devil. <laughs> You know, I mean, take the reciprocal of that. So don't sit around and meditate on the thoughts of the devil. Well, let's, let's go a little further. Let's say that this Christian heard that and didn't take that thought captive and cast it out, but instead he began to entertain that thought. He entertains that thought for a while, and what happens? Well, let's go backwards here. Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. All right, let's back up. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and casting down imaginations, that thought will become an imagination. That thought will become a high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, what's the knowledge of God? The Word of God. Right? So, if I'm being told I'm not going to get healed, that's contrary to the Word of God. If I don't take that thought and pull it out, that thought will take root Okay? Think about this process. The thought will take root and become an imagination. The imagination here, this is a word in the Greek that is logismos. It's the word we get logic from, like computer logic. And there's a good reason for it. The actual word here, logismos, means computation or reasoning. It can also be translated imagination or thought. Well, what is a computation? A computation is where you take input into the computer and compute on it, <laughs> right? So you take that thought from the devil, and if you don't cast it out, you begin to compute on it. You begin to look at it logically, which, remember, is not a spiritual logic. This is an ungodly, natural, earthly, sensual, devilish logic. Earthly, sensual, devilish logic will say, well... I have symptoms, they're in my body, I'm not getting my healing, so therefore, computationally, I have determined that I'm not healed. You see how that works? He keeps you in the natural realm, and you begin to compute on it logically, logically, naturally, and that's not the realm you're supposed to be in. You're supposed to stay in the spiritual realm. How do we stay in the spiritual realm? With the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Did you know the Word of God is spiritual? In other words, it is a spiritual reality. Before we had it written on paper or put in a computer like I'm using tonight, you know, it was actually words that came out of God's own mouth. I literally believe that every word we have in the Bible is spoken out of God's mouth. 
That's why every word contains within it the power to cause that word to come to pass. Now that's actually a Greek translation of a verse over in Luke chapter 1 which is talking about you know, when the angel came to Mary and said, uh, you're going to have the Son of God, you're going to uh, have a, a virgin birth. And she didn't question, wait a minute, I, I can't have a virgin birth. You know, I, she didn't question that. She said, how can I conceive knowing, since I haven't known a man, I'm a virgin. How's that going to happen? She didn't say, I don't believe it's going to happen. She said, how's it going to happen? And the angel said, no word spoken by God is void of the power for that word to come to pass. In other words, the fact that I've come here as a spokesman or angel from God, messenger of God, and spoken God's word to you, this word has the power to cause that to come to pass. Now, in the King James it says, with God nothing is impossible, which is true, but that's not the fullness of that translation. Okay? The point here is, Every word in the Word of God is spoken out of God's own mouth. Every word in the Word of God has spiritual force behind it. So now, as long as we stay in the spiritual realm, not the logic realm, then we can take God's Word, put it in our mouth, speak it out of our mouth, which we've already seen is the two-edged sword of the Word of God. It'll come out of our mouth and it will have power. It will be empowered for it to come to pass. But let's keep going backwards here and see what happens if we have that word from the devil, we've meditated on it, we've computed it, we've used natural, evil, sensual logic to determine that, well, okay, we're not healed. Doesn't look like we're going to get healed. Then what happens, let's back up another step. The pulling down of strongholds. This word is ok roma in the Greek. It means to fortify as a castle to fortify stronghold, you know, in the old ancient, uh, what? Uh, English, British, the old uh, strongholds were called keeps or strongholds. They were castles. They were turrets of a castle. All right, so that's the word that's used here for stronghold, but it literally means a fortified castle. So we've gone from just a thought to an imagination to a castle, to a fortified argument that's been set up. And actually, if we read it here, I didn't read the whole uh, definition. Meaning to fortify through the idea of holding safely a castle, figuratively an argument. So an argument gets built up in your mind that, well, I'm not going to get healed. It went from a thought to an imagination that you thought on to the point that finally it's a stronghold. Now let me ask you this. Is it harder to pull down a stronghold or a thought? It's harder to pull down a stronghold. Because by that time, it's a fortified castle. It's easy to deal with this thought when it comes up. That's not scriptural. The Word of God says, boom. You've dealt with the thought. But if you meditate on that and you think about that and you deal with that long enough till it becomes a stronghold, it's harder to pull down a stronghold. Now, don't despair if you have a stronghold because it says here that they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And this word pulling down is kathesoresis in the Greek. It means demolition, extinction, and destruction. <laughs> so don't worry, it can be destroyed. It can be pulled down. Hallelujah. And I've seen cases where people had strongholds, and the Word of God, they chipped and they attacked with the Word of God until finally they got it out of their life. And I'll tell you this. I grew up Southern Baptist. I had a few strongholds. Growing up, because I had heard my whole life several things that the Baptist church, you know, they didn't even exactly teach it. They, it was just assumed. It's almost stronger because it was just built into the foundation of, of the belief system. It wasn't like they sat there and went over a bunch of scriptures or do's or don'ts or whatever. That This is just the way we all thought. We thought, sadly, that... You never knew what God was going to do. That's one of the things we thought. Another thing we thought was, well, now God can heal. You know, He's perfectly capable of healing, but you never know. He may and He may not. And then again, 
It could be the devil healed that guy for some greater purpose that we don't know about. So when that guy got healed, it may have been the devil. Well, now none of that is scriptural. But if you build that into yourself long enough, it becomes a stronghold. And you have to, you have to get enough word in you to get that stuff, that stronghold, demolished, as the scripture says here, to the point that it doesn't affect you anymore. Well, I know now that the devil can't heal the, a gnat. He couldn't heal somebody if his life depended on it. Healing is not of the devil. It just isn't. If he, if he laid hands on them, they'd get sick. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, he can't heal. All right? Now, if, so, you know, if somebody just kind of got better, <laughs> maybe, but I mean, it ain't going to be the devil getting them better. All right? No, God is the healer. He is the healer to the point that's part of his name. Amen. I mean, God is the one who heals. And see, I know that now. It's part of me now. It's not a stronghold in my life. But growing up, I had to get that out of me. It came as a great shock to me that the devil didn't heal. <laughs> it came as a great uh, shock to me that sickness was not of God. Oh, you mean God doesn't make people sick to teach them something? No, he doesn't. Ever! <laughs> and I could show Scripture that that's the case. But the, I did growing up, I had that stronghold. So I had to get that out of my life. So there are things. And see, here's another thing. Hadn't planned on saying this, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Just dropped in my spirit. And that's this. Check yourself for strongholds. How do you do that? You compare what you believe to the Word of God. Just... By discipline, take the time to compare what you believe to God's Word. Now, we'll say this. There are several... I mean, obviously, the Bible is the very best reference, you know, to, for you to compare against what you believe, right? But there are some resources that I'd like to share with you, one of which is on our website, meaning FBC, fbc.org. There's a little link there that you can click, What Do We Believe? And it's a long list of scripture and statements and all kinds of things that will get you started in a study. Now, you know, you may look at it and go, yeah, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, yeah, of course I know that. But just take the effort, take the time to go through that and look up the scriptures and compare what you believe to that. Now, I can say that because, frankly, I helped write that. <laughs> and I did all the study required to, you know, bring that out. Now, a lot of it came from uh, Rama, A lot of it came from uh, Randy Greer's website, as a matter of fact, and other things that we put all together. And, you know, it talks about what does the Bible say about abortion? What does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about that? All the way through. Homosexuality is in there. What does the Bible say about that? What about the second coming? What about, you know, the rapture? What, all those things. There's things there about all kinds of good stuff. And it's all coming from the Word of God. So it would do you good to just compare what you believe to what we believe. <laughs> you know, on our website, fbc.org, what do we believe? So check that out. That, that would be, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> but I believe it will do you good. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go in, into uh, our next verse of Scripture. Um, keep in mind that relationship, though. A thought becomes an imagination, becomes a stronghold. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Well, see again, this points to the fact that the battle we're looking at is in the middle realm. If, if Satan had a, a method to help defeat people, don't you think it's very likely that that's an area we ought to reinforce or look at? So he says here, in whom the God of this world system, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest or... In other words, this is what would happen if he didn't. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he blinds their minds. See, it's in the mental realm. And here's something else you'll notice. 
The world is coming against the church with arguments. Okay? Remember, thoughts become imaginations which, which become fortified castles of arguments, strongholds. The world right now is attacking Christianity in specific areas. One, no <laughs> surprise here, is in the area of we should accept homosexuality. I mean, after all, it's only fair. It has nothing to do with fair. Is the homosexual lifestyle accepted by God and His Word? No. Now, we're to love the person. We're to believe for their deliverance. We're to give them the Word of God and share the Word of God with them so they will be delivered. But we don't endorse the lifestyle. And yet the world is saying, okay, Christians, you guys need to straighten up. Matter of fact, we had a very well-known political candidate on the Democratic side, no surprise there, said Christians are going to have to get up to date with their beliefs and accept abortion and homosexuality because that's what we all have decided is correct, essentially. I'm very much paraphrasing here. But in so many words, that was what was said. Well, I don't care if the world got together and had a, a big confab, a convention, and said, here's what you guys need to believe. I don't take my marching orders from the world. And I don't take my marching orders from the devil. Matter of fact, the thought, remember, was coming from the devil. <laughs> He's the one blinding people's minds. He's attacking in the mental realm. And he's attacking with these arguments. So here's the point to that. It's going to be harder and harder. This is just the truth. I'm not being negative here. It's going to be harder and harder for Christians to take a stand and say the Bible says. Now we already know that in Canada there have been ministers that have been arrested, put in jail for hate speech, because they got up publicly and read Romans chapter 1 out loud. So, when or if it ever gets to the point that I can't go outside and open my Bible and read Romans chapter 1 without getting drug off to jail, guess who's getting drug off? I mean, I'm still going to be teaching the Word of God. So, I'm going to have to decide now where my stand is. And see, this is what we need to do. This is, this is the preparation we need to be in. Because I tell you what, every time the church gets persecuted, they get tougher. They get stronger. It doesn't hurt us, it helps us, really. Because it separates the sheep from the goats. <laughs> you know, the kind of part-time Christians... I had a guy at, at work. He came to me and says, closes the door. Uh, Bill, uh, aren't you concerned you're being a little vocal about what you believe? No? Well, it might hurt your career. What are you talking about? Well, you saying, you know, stuff about what the Bible says, you know, that, that could come back there. They'll know who to get when it, they want to drag people off. He really was saying this. I said, so you think they're going to come get me and drag me off? Well, they're not going to have to look very far to know who is a Christian. I said, you got that right. If they're coming looking for one, I'll point at myself. And he's like, aren't you afraid? I said, no. You know, praise the Lord. I, think about this. Now, is this going to chafe your word of faith teaching? <laughs> think about it, the scripture that said that the martyrs said, we are, we are glad that we were counted worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Ooh. Oh, you know, down, Brother Bill, I don't know if I want to stand up and say I'm going to get martyred. Well, the, it's, the choice is reject the Word of God or. Well, the or is the only way to go because I ain't going to reject the Word of God. See what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying I believe in for martyrdom. Don't get me wrong. That is not my, my idea of confessing and believing to receive. You know what I'm saying? But I'm just saying, you've got to make a decision. You've got to know where you stand. And you know, there, they, there may be a time when they come to Pastor Ed and say, now, listen, if some homosexual couple comes to your church and says they want to get married, you have to perform the wedding. You know what he's going to say? <laughs> he can do it better than I can. 
But it's the truth. He's not going to go for it. Nor should he go for it. And a church that does go for it, as Pastor has pointed out, it says Ichabod over their door in the spiritual realm. The glory has departed. Because God doesn't put up with playing around with his word. So we need to make a decision. Satan is blinding the minds of the world lest they see the glorious gospel, which is good news, of Jesus Christ, the anointed one and his anointing. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, this is where we're going to end. <laughs> good point. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think, mental realm, this is the battleground, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, as Pastor was pointing out this morning, don't just read it and say, oh yeah, that's great. Do it. <laughs> do it as well. And the peace of God shall be with you. Now I do believe that if they ever do start, you know, throwing people in jail, the peace of God's going to be with me. Because I'm going to be doing what the Word of God says to do. Hallelujah. But now notice this. If it's true, if it's honest, if it's just. Well, let's go back now and just think about for just a moment. What is true? Jesus said, John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. What is honest? God's word is honest. What's just? The word of God is just. What's pure? The pure words of God. What things are lovely? The lovely words of God. What sort of things are of good report? That's the Bible. It's a good report. The gospel is good news. If there be any virtue, virtue is manly excellence. Hallelujah. Manly excellence. Where do we get manly excellence? From the word of God. If there be any praise, where does that come from? The word of God. Think on these things. Well, guess what? Those are all good things to think on, but all I have to do is think on the Word. If I think on the Word, I'm thinking on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, or manly excellence and praiseworthy. If I'll think on those things, I'm thinking on the Word of God. And again, if I compare what I believe to the Word, then I'm, I'm really fortifying myself now see, here's the thing about, we were talking about that scripture that said a thought becomes an imagination and becomes a stronghold. Here's a, a reminder for you that the Lord just reminded me about. And that's this. That process can be used for good or can be used for evil. The process of taking a thought, meditating on that thought until it becomes a stronghold. You can do that with the Word of God. Take a thought from the Word of God. Meditate on it. Turn it around in your heart and in your spirit and in your mind until it becomes a stronghold in your life. See, the stronghold is a fortified castle. See, it can be good or bad. So we can fortify ourselves with the Word. And see, that's really... Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing this out. That's really what he's talking about when he says compare what you believe to what we believe according to the Word of God. Just take the effort, the time to go through and take that thought. Meditate on that thought. And once you do that, then you start comparing those things with what you believe and you'll find that it will be a blessing to you. I'm actually going to go to the Faith and Victory Church website. Hallelujah. Since he brought that up. And uh, under the new here, little dealy. What do we believe is the second option down, or the third option down if you count the first line. So I'm going to click on that. And it says, what do we believe? The Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. The Bible is the one and only inspired, literally meaning spoken out of God's own mouth, Word of God, and revelation of His Word comes by the Holy Spirit, the teacher of the church. It is re the revealed Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16, and on and on and on. Quotes a bunch of Scripture. So, Take that thought. The Word of God literally is the Word that came out of God's own mouth. I'm going to take that and I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to turn that around in my heart until it becomes such a stronghold in my life 
to understand that God's Word is true. God's Word will never change. Not one jot or tittle or we might say period or comma of it will ever pass away. That's how solid the Word of God is. So I can take that and I can build that into my life as a stronghold. Then I go to the next one, the Godhead, the Trinity. Our God is one but is manifested in three unique persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All are equal and eternal. Scripture for that. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Word made flesh, with Scripture for that. And He is the express image of God. The Holy Spirit proceeds forth from both the Father and the Son and is eternal. And there's Scripture for that. So I take that and I incorporate that into my life. See, start building this into your heart. Man, the fallen redemption, the first principles of faith, the, uh, the new birth and eternal life, water baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, sanctification and living a separated life, worldly practices, abortion, words or carriers of power, divine healing, divine prosperity, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection of the just, and hell and eternal retribution. Hell's real. It is actually really a place of torment. Do you know there's a lot of Christians that will argue that point with you? There's not really a hell. God would never send anyone to hell. Well, God's not sending anybody. But if you're attached to the devil, if you remember what Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees, ye are of your father the devil. If you're spiritually connected to the devil, when he gets cast in, guess where you're going? <laughs> Sad to say, but it's true. God didn't put you there. You're just going with your father. Because that's where your spiritual connection is. So get unconnected from him, get born again, connected to the Father, and then you go to heaven. Hallelujah. Now that's just a real quick rundown, but you get the idea. We can take these things and build them into us. We can take the Word of God and make it a stronghold in our life. And we should. And in these days particularly, these last of the last days, there are some things coming down the pike where you're going to have to be strong. And you're going to have to be solid. And thankfully, hallelujah, you're coming to a church that's preaching the uncompromising word of faith and the solid word of God with no compromise. And we are told these things on a regular basis. So, I mean, we've got it made. I, you know, I am really concerned for the people that are all these lukewarm, seeker-friendly churches that just want to, you know, dance around and wave their little banners and have a big time and there's no scripture. There's no solid word of God taught. Because what are they going to do when it, the problem comes? The evil day actually does come. you know. Because like Pastor says, it's coming. It's not unbelief to say that. It is actually coming. So we need to take the Word of God and live it and apply it in order to overcome. Because see, we are world overcomers. We do actually overcome the world. But we do that through the words of our mouth, through the Word of God, through applying these principles. Hallelujah. So, did you get anything out of this tonight? Praise the Lord. I sure did. <laughs> I needed this. I tell you, sometimes you study things and it just is a blessing to get into some of these things. Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address PO Box 7752 Greensboro, North Carolina 27417 If you would like to contribute to our ministry please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button Thank you and may God richly bless you for your giving